So hello everyone, welcome. We're very happy to be here with this wonderful webinar on family language policies among Quebec-based uh, parents raising multilingual infants and toddlers with R Ruth Kisher, Erin Cork, Susan Ballinger, and Krista Byers Hangling. Hopefully I said your names right. If I didn't, please correct me, more or less. My Portuguese uh, accent, uh, it's, that's how I, 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 I think first. Um, and we also and, have Nicola Phillips and um, Alexa who are joining us today. To talk. Oh, great. Thank you, Ruth, for, 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 compliment, uh, for saying everyone's names. And I'm going to, uh, uh, and this is the, the TESOL Bilingual Multilingual Special Interest Group of the TESOL International Organization. And we are very happy to host this uh, webinar today. So I'll pass the baton to the presenters and we're very excited to be here. Well, thank you so much, Clara, for the invitation. We're really happy to have this opportunity to share our research with the TESOL community. So as the title suggests, the talk is about language, family language policies among Quebec-based parents who are raising multilingual infants and toddlers. And in this talk, we will focus on two interconnected studies that we conducted. Um, in study one, we used interviews and focus groups to elicit qualitative data from parents in Quebec's urban centre, Montreal. And in study two, we used a questionnaire that was developed based on the findings from study one. Um, and with this questionnaire, we elicited qualitative as well as quantitative data from parents across the entire province of Quebec. Now, the aim for each component of these studies was firstly to make a theoretical contribution by advancing our knowledge regarding different aspects of family language policy, and secondly, also to make a practical contribution by laying the groundwork for the development of measures that can actually support caregivers who are raising their children with multiple languages. Now, um, to give you a little bit of background before we go into the details about these studies, Krista will begin by talking a little bit about family language policies in general, by providing the sociolinguistic context regarding Quebec and Montreal, and by providing some general information about language acquisition among multilingual infants and toddlers more generally. Then Susan will take over and present the first study, the one that's based in Montreal. And then for the second study about all of Quebec, I will start by presenting the language attitudes component, then Erin will take over and present the concerns component, then we have Nikki, who will be talking about language practices, and I think Susan might join in a little bit for that as well. Um, then we have Alexa, who will discuss the resources component, and then at the end it's back to Krista, who will provide a commentary on the whole project. So, over to Krista. Thank you, Ruth. Um, so, today our theme is family language policy. And just to define that a little bit before we talk about it, one uh, more well-known, oh, I have a little echo, I don't know if mic is on. Uh, one well-known definition of family language policy is that it is the... <laughs> the explicit and overt planning in relation to language use within the home among family members. Now, more recent theories have downplayed the explicit nature of this family planning. And in this presentation, we'll conceptualize uh, family language planning or FLP in terms of three elements. So uh, beliefs about languages, practices about languages and language planning and maintenance. Um, and family language policy is important and something that we really wanted to study because it can affect children's well-being, their family relationships, their healthy identity, um, and the maintenance of languages, especially for minority languages. So to give you a little bit of background context of where our research took place, all of, or all of our studies, both of them, uh, the data was collected in Quebec. So Quebec is a Canadian province. Uh, you can see it here on the map. Um, so it has a population of 8.1 million people. 2.3% of those are Indigenous peoples, including First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples. 13.7% are foreign born outside of Canada, uh, and about 10% have parents who are foreign born. In terms of the first languages of individuals in Quebec, about 80% uh, speak French, 
9% English and 14.5% speak another language uh, other than French or English. Um, and the languages most spoken at home sort of reflect these similar percentages. So 82% French, 12% English, and 10% other. So we see a majority Francophone province uh, with quite a sizable uh, English speaking majority, as well as many other languages that are spoken. Study one, which we'll talk about, took place specifically in Montreal. So this is a city of 1.7 million people, one of Canada's larger cities. Uh, less than 1% are Indigenous, uh, but we have a much higher proportion of foreign-born individuals than the province as a whole, so 23% of Montrealers are foreign-born. Montreal is also Canada's most trilingual city, so more than 21% of Montreal residents speak at least three languages. And in terms of what those languages are, there are several communities that have quite deep roots in the, in the city, uh, including Greek, Haitian Creole, Hebrew, Italian, and Portuguese speaking communities. But if we look at the languages that are most spoken today in the city other than English and French, those are Arabic, Italian, and Spanish. So the population that we're going to be talking about is one that not everyone thinks about when they think of bilingual or multilingual individuals. So this is uh, babies and toddlers. So our study focused on children uh, age birth to four years old hearing two or more languages at home. And just to remind you a little bit about what we expect for the development of children around this age, what they can do. So from birth, babies can tell different languages apart. So they can hear the difference between different languages. Around 12 months, they say their first words, whether they're learning one language or multiple languages. At 36 months, so around three years old, they can put them together in three to word, four word sentences. Um, and in terms of bilingualism and exposure to multiple languages, um, you know, this, this period is very important because this early exposure to a language or to multiple languages uh, has been linked on average to higher proficiency in those languages. Of course, there are certainly many exceptions uh, for individuals who were not early exposed and nonetheless achieve high proficiency. Uh, at the same time, we know that early multilingualism or exposure to multiple languages does not cause language disorders and does not cause language delays, although just like monolingual children, some bilingual and multilingual children will have language disorders and delays, and we'll, we'll come back to this point in the end. Um, but keeping this in mind, the developmental path of these children is not necessarily the same, um, and this relates to some of the, the points that we're going to bring up in terms of family language policies. So now I'll hand things over to Susan Ballinger. Thanks, Krista. Uh, so yes, I'm going to talk about our first study of the two studies. And this study focused on the family language policies of Montreal area parents who are raising uh, their firstborn child with more than one language. So for the study, we ran nine focus groups and interviews uh, with 27 parents from 20 different households. Their children were uh, between birth and three years old. Uh, two French-English bilingual researchers moderated a discussion that focused on the parents' language ideologies. So as we said, that means attitudes and beliefs, their language practices, so how they use language with their children, um, the types of plans that they're making uh, and actions that they take to maintain that language uh, in and outside of their household and their stated needs uh, in order to raise their children multilingually. So amongst our participants, there were four different groups of households. So we had uh, households that were French English speaking, households that were French English plus at least one heritage language, French and heritage language, English and heritage language. So what I want you to notice is that amongst these four groups, um, there are actually two other groups. There's, there are heritage language households and there are non-heritage language households. So. All right, so, uh, sorry, I realize Krista, I use my hands a lot. I'll try not to, <laughs> not confuse you. Um, so we, uh, we had two research questions. The first was, uh, what are parents, obviously, ideologies, practices, plans, and needs? And then we wanted to look and see if there was any difference um, amongst the heritage and the non-heritage language households in the way that they talked about these issues. So we used data analysis. The data analysis that we used was deductive and inductive thematic coding. And I'm gonna present our findings here based on like according to these different issues we were looking at and the themes that were associated with them. 
So the first theme that came out was uh, in relationship to ideologies, so beliefs and attitudes, was tempered optimism towards multilingualism. As a whole, uh, all of the parents were very positive in relationship to, um, to bilingualism, multilingualism, and they were optimistic about their ability to raise their children uh, with more than one language. Uh, they viewed this as being very valuable for, uh, for pragmatic reasons, for their child's future employment and travel, for social reasons and for connection with culture. So um, for communication with other groups, for connecting with their family members, for connecting with their culture. And uh, one, one participant put it really simply by saying, when children don't learn their heritage language, they lose something valuable, right? Some parents talked about the cognitive advantages of this. Uh, one parent referred to the fact that uh, if my child is exposed to a lot of languages now, they'll be a better language learner in the future if they wanna learn another language. And as a whole, there was, as a whole, there was this lack of concern about the, the, that there might be a language delay, that their child might mix languages or trans language, um, especially early on. So, oh, I think we need to go back one. So, oh, okay, practices maybe is gonna come up later. Okay, so, can, so in terms of, excuse me, sorry, I just got lost. So when we looked at the data more closely um, and we looked at the heritage language households versus the non-heritage language households, what we saw is that there was less optimism um, about their overall ability to support their child's uh, development. Because they, they felt this burden and the full responsibility of doing this, sometimes only one parent in the household, there was only one person interacting with the child in one of their heritage languages, they worried about things like not being good enough, like not being sufficient language models, not being able to do it. They were worried about their child's uh, future, like, uh, pushback against using the heritage language as they got older. And amongst this group, there was a little more concern about exposing their kids to too many languages and the impact that this might have on their language delay, their language mixing or translanguaging, and how that might impact them at school. All right, so we're back on track. So practice in terms of the their language practices, uh, the theme that emerged was a natural approach. So although almost all of the parents talked about using a uh, one parent, one language approach, they had, a, they had a pretty flexible view of this. Uh, they also were really interested in ex immersing their kids in and exposing them to as many languages as possible. And nine out of the 20 families had chosen a daycare with a language that was not even one of the languages they were speaking at home just because they really believed in exposing their kid to as many languages as possible. Uh, I would say they also, we could say they also had a laissez-faire attitude <laughs> to a certain extent, as opposed to what we may have seen more so in that past studies of family language policies where parents were often really concerned about maintaining strictly that one language. Um, we often heard statements like, um, as the kid gets older, I'm always going to go with the flow. I'm going to take it as it comes. Similarly, in French, a parent said, Je vais faire instinctivement comme ça, puis je laisse les choses aller, uh, which is basically the same thing as what was written in English. And overall, the parents themselves were not all that worried about their own language mixing with the kids. We often heard them say, make statements to this effect. Um, in fact, one parent even said, you know, uh, to paraphrase, my, my partner mixes up English and French all the time and he's fine, so our kid is gonna be fine too. Um, when we look at the heritage language parents, it's a little different. There was more fears, worries, concerns about their practices. So they, like I said, if they, they felt like if they were too strict in pushing the kids to use the heritage language, the kids might push back um, and start to have a, bad, a, a negative attitude towards the language. Similarly, although some of the parents do have this heritage language school resource available to them where they could put their kids in these schools, after school or on the weekends, they were worried their kids might not um, might not like that very much because it was eating into their free time and they would develop this negative attitude. All right, so in terms of uh, the parents' stated needs, the overall theme was that they wanted more 
bilingual and multilingual resources. Mm -hmm. They were pretty satisfied with their existing monolingual English and monolingual French resources overall, but they wanted more, more spaces where these languages could coexist, like within books, within media, within extracurricular activities. Many of them wanted to meet other bilingual, multilingual families, and some of them had joined this study for that purpose. Um, they wanted resources for them as well that were about how to parent, how to raise a child bilingually that they felt they didn't have. Um, and they also wanted more choice with their schooling options, more bilingual, multilingual schooling options. As you may expect at this point, the, the heritage language parents were um, more dissatisfied with existing resources. Either they didn't have resources like books and media for their kids, or they weren't, uh, what they had was not meeting their needs. So I wanna just end with this quote from a parent who says, I think there should be more schools, education, media that's geared toward bilingualism specifically because it's reality that there's English and French in Quebec. And I think it could be interesting to mix it up. And on behalf of our heritage language participants, I just wanna add that of course it's also reality that there are many other languages in Quebec. Okay, so. If you want to read more about study one and also to learn more about the uh, comparison of fa our family language policies for these participants with the official language policy in Quebec, please check out our publication from 2020 in the Journal of Multilingual and Multicultural Development. And I think I'm handing it over to Ruth. Yes, we need to do a quick switch over in terms of whose screen is being shared. So we're now switching from Krista sharing her screen to Nikki sharing her screen as a little reflection of so many people giving a presentation together. Um, but yeah, as, uh, as Susan has said, I'm gonna be talking to you about the, um, I'm gonna start by talking about the second study, um, which as we said, was a questionnaire study. Um, where we looked at language beliefs, language behaviors, and language management among parents, not just in Montreal, but across the entire province of Quebec. And um, we used the findings from study one as a basis for the development of this questionnaire. All right, we're back on track with, uh, with the correct screen. So yeah, questionnaire developed based on the findings from study one. Um, the questionnaire was distributed online by different mailing lists, as well as traditional and social media. And participants were also encouraged to share the questionnaire with further potential participants. So we employed snowball sampling. Um, the people who actually took part in this study were 844 Quebec-based parents who are raising infant or toddler, this time up to the age of four, with multiple languages, again, in the home. We realize it's also very interesting to look at people um, whose children are growing up with multiple languages in other contexts, but our study focused specifically on the home. Um, now, in the figure on this slide, you can see the language combinations with which participants' children were being raised. So we've got participants raised, whose kids were being raised with English and French, English and French and other, English and other, French and other, and others. And others here refers to heritage languages, and in the case of our study, it should be noted that these were predominantly immigrant heritage languages. So we had only a very small number of participants who were raising their children with indigenous heritage languages. And while we're grouping heritage languages together here for the sake of our analyses, it should definitely be remembered that heritage language communities in Quebec are far from homogeneous. Okay, so that's the study, a uh, study two in general. I'll now look at um, the specific um, part of the, the second study that focuses on language attitudes. Um, and before I talk to you about attitudes towards childhood multilingualism, which is what this component focuses on, I want to give you a little bit of general information just to provide some context. So attitudes are usually assumed to be composed of three components, namely the feelings solicited by an attitude object, the beliefs held about the attitude object, and the behavior directed at the attitude object. And here, we're gonna focus on the beliefs component, which is part of family language policy. Now, almost all previous language attitudes research has looked at attitudes towards individual languages and um, studies that have been conducted over several decades and in numerous parts of the world have shown that attitudes towards individual languages 
uh, have two main evaluative dimensions, namely status and solidarity. A language that has high status is a language that's associated with power, economic opportunity and upward social mobility. So attitudes on the status dimension are definitely linked with the utilitarian value of the language. By contrast, languages that are evaluated positively on the solidarity dimension are languages that elicit a feeling, a feeling of attachment and belonging among people. So these are languages that hold vital social meaning and therefore attitudes on the solidarity dimension are linked with social identity and in-group loyalty. Now we know from previous research that attitudes towards multilingualism are conceptually distinct from attitudes towards specific languages that are involved in a multilingual context. However, there's very little work on attitudes towards multilingualism itself, and even less work on attitudes specifically towards childhood multilingualism. And so we don't really have any conclusive evidence about what the determinants and the dimensionality of attitudes towards childhood multilingualism are. Interestingly, though, based on the findings from the first phase of our from the first study, um, we get the impression that parents distinguish between the utilitarian value of childhood multilingualism and the importance of childhood multilingualism for in-group communication. And so this made us wonder whether attitudes towards childhood multilingualism also have a status and a solidarity dimension. In addition to this, the findings from the first study also indicated that the cognitive advantages that are imported by childhood multilingualism were very much on parents' minds. So as Susan said, for example, parents seem to believe that multiling being multilingual would make it easier for children to learn future languages later on in life. So this made us wonder whether cognitive development constitutes an additional dimension of attitudes towards childhood multilingualism. And so based on this, we formulated our two research questions for this component of the study, which are firstly, do parents' attitudes towards childhood multilingualism constitute a unitary factor or do they have different evaluative dimensions? And secondly, what demographic and sociolinguistic variables correlate with parents' attitudes towards childhood multilingualism, thus constituting potential predictors? So the items that we used in our questionnaire were 12 statements about childhood multilingualism, whose response options were five point Likert scales, where one meant don't agree at all and five meant agree completely. And these items were explicitly designed to tap status, solidarity and cognitive development. To answer research question one, we ran exploratory factor analysis, and to answer research question two, we ran multiple regressions. So turning to the results, the factor matrix, which you can see here, shows that the factor loadings do indeed support a division into our three hypothesized dimensions, namely a status dimension, a solidarity dimension, and a cognitive development dimension. Because as you can see here, the items that tap parents' beliefs about the utilitarian value of multilingualism loaded onto one factor, the, the items that tap parents' beliefs about the importance of childhood multilingualism for in-group membership and communication loaded onto a separate factor, and then the items that tap parents' beliefs that knowing multiple languages entails cognitive benefits for their child loaded onto another separate factor. And as you can see from the Cromax alpha values, the items that loaded onto each factor had very high internal consistency. So we've got 0.79 for the status dimension, 0.67 for the solidarity factor, and 0.81 for the cognitive development factor. Now, our study is the first to confirm the multidimensionality of attitudes towards childhood multilingualism. We confirmed status and solidarity as distinct dimensions which shows that the importance of these dimensions applies not just to attitudes towards individual languages, but it also extends to attitudes towards childhood multilingualism. And we confirmed cognitive development as a separate dimension, which is notable because no previous research had ever attested this before. Now, following the factor analysis, we combined the items that loaded onto each factor and we calculated their means. And that allowed us to calculate an overall mean for attitudes on the status dimension, an overall value for attitudes on the solidarity dimension, and an overall value for attitudes on the cognitive development dimension. And if you recall that five was agree completely for all attitudes items, then we can see that the attitudes really were very positive on all three dimensions, because we found an overall mean of 4.74 for status, 4.55 for solidarity, and 4.43 for cognitive development. And notably, the three factors that we found accounted for quite a lot of the variance, um, status for 19%, solidarity for 16.8%, and cognitive development for 22.6%. So together, they accounted for almost 60% of the variance, which indicates that they were really important, these dimensions. 
but the finding that they don't account for all of the variants suggests that further dimensions of parental attitudes towards childhood multilingualism may exist, and definitely further research is needed to establish this. Okay, so in the next step of the attitudes component of study two, we investigated four variables as potential predictors of attitudes towards childhood multilingualism. Firstly, location within Quebec, where we compared parents living in Montreal versus the rest of the province. Linguistic background, so parents who'd grown up multilingually themselves versus parents who'd grown up monolingually. Approach to promoting multilingualism, so parents who are using one parent, one language versus other approaches. And the language is transmitted, so parents whose kids were being raised with or without heritage languages. And the results from the multiple regressions that we ran showed that the languages transmitted constituted the main predictor of parents' attitudes towards childhood multilingualism. With regard to the cognitive development dimension, we found no significant effect. But on the status dimension, we found that the presence of a heritage language among the languages transmitted was associated with less positive status-related attitudes towards childhood multilingualism. Now, why could this be? Well, the questionnaire items were all phrased in a non-context specific manner, and we didn't make any reference to specific languages. But still, it's possible that the participants interpreted the status items as pertaining to the Quebec context, and as referring to multilingualism involving the specific languages with which they were raising their children. And this would explain why the non-heritage language parents, whose kids were growing up with English and French, so two languages that hold very high utilitarian value in Quebec, why they were expressing more positive attitudes towards childhood multilingualism than the heritage language parents, whose kids were growing up with at least one language that doesn't hold very much utilitarian value in Quebec. Obviously, more research needed to find out. On the solidarity dimension, on the other hand, the presence of a heritage language was associated with more positive solidarity related attitudes towards childhood multilingualism. Now, if you're raising a multilingual child yourself, you will know that raising a kid with languages other than the main societal languages of a community requires an extra effort and it's not always easy. So it's likely that the parents who are transmitting heritage language despite the added effort and difficulty, that they hold a very strong conviction that acquiring these heritage languages will entail an important benefit for their children. And we think that this is a benefit linked to the importance of the heritage languages to the social groups that they identify with and with in-group communication. So this serves as a likely explanation for the fact that the heritage languages parents in this study held more positive attitudes towards um, childhood multilingualism on the solidarity dimension than the non-heritage language parents did. So to answer our research questions for this component of study two, firstly, do parents' attitudes towards childhood multilingualism constitute a unitary factor or do they have different evaluative dimensions? Well, we saw that they do have different evaluative dimensions, namely status, solidarity, and cognitive development. Further research is necessary to investigate further dimensions, and that's what we're currently doing by looking at the qualitative data about beliefs from our questionnaire. But knowing about these three dimensions is already very useful because it helps us advance attitude theory, and it enables a much more nuanced investigation of the role that language attitudes, um, that attitudes towards childhood multilingualism play in intergenerational language transmission. Research question two was what demographic and sociolinguistic variables correlate with parents' attitudes towards childhood multilingualism, thus constituting potential predictors. And we found that the main predictor is the presence of a heritage language among the languages that are being transmitted. Again, further research is necessary, but knowing about this helps us lay the groundwork for developing appropriate measures to support families who wish to raise their children multilingually. So this is it regarding the attitudes component of study two. And now I'll pass over to Erin, who will tell you more about the concerns component of this study. Thank you, Ruth. So as Ruth said, I'll be presenting the part of the study that investigated parents' concerns for their child's multilingual development. And as you heard earlier in Susan's presentation of study one, parents expressed some concerns, for example, whether their child would be able to cope with multiple languages in their exposure and whether they would be able to, <clears throat> whether parents would be able to fully support their child's language development. <clears throat> Excuse me. There's actually been very little research that directly addresses parents' concerns, and in particular in a context like Quebec, where multilingualism is prevalent on the societal level. And so this uh, part of the study addressed this gap by asking the following questions. 
Uh, first, what is the nature of parents' concerns regarding their child's multilingual development? And more specifically, we asked, uh, are these concerns unitary or are there different factors within these concerns? And based on the study uh, one findings, we predicted that concerns would comprise two factors, uh, concerns about children's language environment. So for example, if children are getting enough exposure to their languages and concerns about children's language outcomes. So for example, if children are uh, likely to experience a language delay as a result of multilingualism. In study one and other prior research, parents have been dismissive of certain concerns, but not others. And this leads us to our second research question, which was, what are the strongest concerns that parents have regarding their child's multilingual development? And for this research question, we predicted that language environment concerns would be stronger than um, language, uh, excuse me, children's outcomes concerns. Um, based on the fact that in, parent, in study one, parents dismissed concerns about language delay, as you heard, but they weren't as dismissive of um, concerns about children getting enough exposure to their language, uh, languages, for example. And finally, uh, as Susan mentioned, uh, parents of children acquiring a heritage language showed more concern about their child's multilingual development than other parents. And so our third research question asks about heritage language transmission, but also other child and parent characteristics, which we predicted would lead to higher levels of concern. And these include um, children's trilingualism or acquisition of three or more languages, as well as children having a reported developmental issue that could affect language development. And in terms of parent characteristics, uh, we predicted that parents who have not experienced um, growing up multilingual themselves um, might be more concerned. Um, for example, you heard um, Susan refer to a parent who um, recalled that or expressed that her partner was mixing, but he was doing just fine. So we, we predicted that parents' own experiences would be relevant for their level of concern. And uh, finally, we predicted that less positive attitudes um, towards childhood multilingualism on the three dimensions that Ruth just discussed would also be um, linked to stronger concerns. Next slide, slide please. Thank you. So there were 10 items in the questionnaire that touched on parent concerns, nine Likert scale items, which were statements like, I worry that it will confuse my child if I use different languages with them, um, to which parents had to respond on the same scale that Ruth described one to five, one being I don't agree at all, and five being I completely agree. And there was one open-ended item, which asked in your own words, uh, would, could you describe your main concern about raising your child with more than one language, which uh, we're in the process of analyzing um, with a corpus analysis, but I won't um, go over those results today in this presentation. So um, the analyses that I will present are for um, research question one, uh, an exploratory factor analysis uh, that was conducted in R. Um, for research question two, we uh, calculated the mean level of concern for items loading onto each factor um, and compared those means to see if concerns differed in strength. And for research question three, we ran correlations between overall concern level and um, factor means and the uh, different parent and child characteristics that I introduced on the previous slide to view which may be potential predictors of concern. Next slide, please. Uh, here is the factor matrix for research question one. Um, so the numbers um, represent the factor loadings and which are correlations between the items and the factors. And the placement and bolding shows you which factors um, loaded, sorry, which factors each item loaded onto. And the orange and blue backgrounds represent how we predicted concerns would pattern onto factors, uh, orange being language environment concerns and blue being language outcomes, sorry, children's outcomes um, concerns. And as you can see, our predictions were only partially borne out. Um, so the loadings here represent a different distinction than we actually had expected. So what is that distinction? Um, well, if you look at the fact, uh, the items that load onto factor one, which are items 43 to 48, I'll just uh, point your eye to a few key words that kind of suggest what they have in common. Um, too challenging, confused, difficult to distinguish, short-term delay. Um, you'll notice that these are all cognitive difficulties that children could experience due to their multilingualism. So we believe that this factor represents child-centered cognitive issue concerns. Um, now let's look at uh, factor two, items 41, 42, and 49 loaded onto this factor. And again, I'll point your eye to some key phrases, um, getting enough exposure, whether I'm able to fully help my child, um, becoming a confident and fluent speaker of each language. And uh, so these represent what we've conceived of as macro level concerns, which are parent-centered or external to the child. And they basically involve concerns that children's language exposure and outcomes will be in some way insufficient. <clears throat> so I'll refer, <clears throat> excuse me, I'll refer to them as macro exposure outcomes concerns. 
And I should note that the first factor accounted for 44% of the variance in responses, and the second factor accounted for 22%, so a total of 66% of the variance was accounted for by these two factors. Next slide, please. Um, so research question two asked about the relative strength of concerns. And here you can see on the left, uh, the means uh, for the level of concerns for each factor. And on the right, you can see how the responses were distributed for the two factors. Uh, the mean level of concern for child-centered cognitive concerns was quite low, 1.8 on a scale of one to five. And you can see by the distribution that a response of one or not agreeing at all, not being concerned at all, are fairly prevalent. <clears throat> Um, the mean for exposure outcomes concerns is slightly higher, um, and this is a significant difference with a mean of 2.3. And in the distribution on the right, you can see that the level of, level of concern is a bit more evenly distributed um, with some more parents on the lower end than on the higher end, but a more gradual difference. So this seems to indicate that parents are more divided in a way over the cognitive concerns than um, the exposure outcomes concerns. Um, next slide, please. And then to answer research question three, we ran correlations between um, parent, the parent and child characteristics and the level of concern overall and then for each factor. And for the sake of brevity, I'll just go over the overall mean results here. Um, so you can see that in terms of overall concern strength, transmission of a heritage language, um, transmission of three or more languages and attitudes on the cognitive dimension are all correlated with um, the concern strength. And note that we um, had inverted the scale for the attitudes, so that positive correlation coefficient for attitudes means that the weaker parents uh, felt about the attitudes on the cognitive dimension, actually the more uh, concerned they were for their child's multilingual development. Okay, next slide, please. So to sum up, um, for research question one, we found that parents have concerns of two types at least. Further exploration may find more factors because as I said, 66% of the variance was accounted for by these factors, but that leaves a substantial amount of variation to be accounted for. Um, the concerns that we measured were generally low to moderate in these parents. And um, it's an interesting question whether this is something that is specific to Quebec, uh, a multilingual society, or if this might be true in other contexts where monolingual, uh, monolingual societies like the US and the UK um, another question that remains is what about parents who have opted out of raising their children multilingually? All of our parents had opted in um, by definition by participating in the study. And so it might be an interesting question to see if parents have higher concerns, um, parents who have opted out have higher concerns than these parents. With respect to question two, um, our findings uh, are finding that the cognitive issue concerns were low is in line with our finding um, from the attitudes part of this project that parents' attitudes on the cognitive dimension were quite high. So it seems that these parents view multilingualism as conferring advantages rather than difficulties in terms of children's cognition. Um, for research question three, we found in line with study one and other parts of study two, a distinction between heritage language transmitting parents and non-heritage transmitting um, parents in terms of their level of concern. And we also found a distinction between bilinguals and trilinguals. And I think it's worth pointing out here that um, I didn't present this, but we did a linear regression model with both um, heritage language transmission and trilingualism in it, because of course, all trilinguals are also necessarily uh, transmitting a heritage language. And these are two um, distinct relationships that remain significant when modeled together. So it does seem that parents who are raising children with a heritage language and parents who are raising children with three languages or more are more concerned about their children's language development. And finally, I think it's worth considering what are the implications? Why does this matter? Um, well, concerns can guide parents' language use decisions. Um, and parents' language use decisions may in turn influence children's language outcomes, um, in particular for heritage languages. And we've seen that heritage language parents are more concerned. So a better understanding and being better able to address these concerns may in turn be a key support part of supporting children's multilingual development. Um, and that's all for me. I'll turn it over to Nicola at this point. Thank you. Um, so um, I'm going to be talking about the language practices portion of the study. Uh, our mandate for the language practices study was to use the questionnaire data to better understand the practices of families raising uh, emerging bilinguals. Um, our study is actually still in the developmental stage. So today we're sharing our plan rather than our results. The way that we want to approach the language practices data is first of all, by asking about what language practices we see in general. 
Uh, specifically, we are going to be asking um, what factors determine caregivers' frequency of language use for each language being transmitted with their multilingual infant or toddler. Um, our outcome measure is the frequency with which caregivers report using their mother tongue with their child on a scale of one to five, as we can see here. And the predictors that we are considering are reported level of caregiver competency in specific languages, also measured uh, one to five. Uh, the role of the language in Quebec, so whether it's the majority language, French, the minority but doesn't quite work like a minority language, English, or heritage language. Um, and their attitude scores that were computed as part of Ruth's attitude paper. We intend to assess each variable as a predictor independently first off, and then build a model where we analyze them all together. Um, as we heard earlier, there are three attitude dimensions and they will each be treated as a unique independent predictor. So this brings me to our conceptual model. We base this on the literature, but also on the unique language environment of Quebec. And we established uh, that there are multiple factors that we expect to play a role in Quebec caregivers' language practices. Um, so this model represents these interrelated variables and they're helping uh, inform our research questions and hypotheses. A number of researchers have hypothesized that caregiver attitudes towards multilingualism are strongly related to whether languages are transmitted from one generation to the next. So we expect to see attitudes uh, play an important role in language practices. But uh, caregiver attitudes are multidimensional, as we've seen. Additionally, those attitude dimensions can vary from family to family based not only on the status or role their languages have in the wider community, but also on the role that their languages have within the household. So that is whether both caregivers use all the languages being transmitted versus there being a strongly dominant household language. And we consider further that uh, both the role of a language in a community as well as the dominance of a language in a household will also themselves directly affect the likelihood of a language being transmitted. Importantly, we consider that caregiver proficiency in a language is likely to impact the extent to which a language is transmitted. And while we're currently unsure of precisely how all these factors are going to interact, we do consider this model as a good jumping off point for building our hypotheses. Uh, we're initially going to start by focusing on just three direct predictors and how they contribute to variability in language practices. These are caregiver attitudes, the role of the language in the community, and caregiver proficiency. Uh, finally, as a first step, we're focusing our analysis on caregivers' transmission of their mother tongue, or tongues only, rather than uh, any languages that they acquired as an adult. To examine language, language practices from a slightly different angle, we're also going to consider what parents told us about how they behave in specific situations. Uh, our responders were asked to determine, in a particular instance, which language they use. And they were allowed to select as many options from this multiple choice list as were applicable to them. And they include where we are, what I'm talking about, which language my child will understand better, etc. We're going to do a quantitative analysis of these responses to see the range of factors that influence caregivers' behaviors. And um, finally, our respondents were also asked to elaborate and tell us more in their own words about the factors that determine which language they use with their child in a particular instance. We're going to perform a qualitative analysis to see if caregivers raise any additional issues that were not addressed in uh, our previous question. Both the quantitative and qualitative analysis are pretty exploratory in nature, but uh, based on the family language policy literature, we anticipate that some key theme themes are going to emerge, namely a need to be able to communicate easily or naturally themselves um, and also to facilitate their child understanding. Uh, their need to accommodate other people in their environment and also parents' intentional efforts to provide a stimulating bilingual environment for their child. That's our current plan. Um, we'd love it if you have any feedback for us, any thoughts, any comments. Um, so please let us know. And I'm now gonna hand this over to Alexa. Thanks, Nikki, thanks so much. Um, as for the language management component of multilingual child rearing, uh, we thought it was important to investigate resources, uh, not only because this stood out as an important finding uh, from the first phase uh, of our research project, so study one, but also because resources can afford uh, opportunities to engage with children in the language of choice. 
uh, for example, through storybooks, games, etc. And this we conceptualized as child-directed resources in this study. Also, uh, resources can offer information about multilingual child rearing through, for example, uh, websites, guides, etc., uh, which we conceptualized as parent-directed resources. Now, we also thought that resources were important to investigate because um, they could possibly also play a role in intergenerational language transmission, especially for um, children being raised with heritage languages. Now, this prompted our desire to answer the following research questions. Are there differences between heritage language parents and non-heritage language parents' awareness and use of, as well as desire for both child-directed and uh, parent-directed resources? Now, for the sake of time today, although we uh, quantitatively uh, investigated parents' awareness, use, and desire for resources, I'll only present our qualitative findings uh, that pertain to both group of parents' uh, desire for additional child and parent-directed resources. Uh, yeah. Next slide, please. All right, thank you. Sorry, I was quite lost also. Uh, now, while digging into the family language policy literature to find studies that looked uh, at resources as a form of language management, we quickly realized that there were very few of such studies, which made it even more evident that we needed to conduct the current study. Uh, we did, however, find some studies that mentioned resources, but with older children, which I'll briefly present right now. So what stood out from the literature with regards to child-directed uh, resources specifically was that firstly, there seemed to be a preference for printed resources, such as storybooks, amongst both group of parents. Also, that heritage language parents had difficulties accessing uh, resources in heritage languages, and that there seemed to be also a stronger desire for resources uh, in the heritage language parent group. Now, for literature mentioning parent-directed resources, findings were much more scarce and in inconsistent, but what stood out was that some heritage language parents uh, used very few resources to raise their children multilingually, while others relied on such resources. And finally, that both group of parents used resources in societal languages to raise their children multilingually. Now, this led us to predict that heritage language parents would express more of a desire for additional child and parent directed resources than non heritage language parents. Next. Now, we kept 824 participants' responses to analyze for this particular study, of which 60.2% of the parents were identified as heritage language parents. Uh, and 99.9 .9 of the transmitted languages were immigrant languages, with the most common ones being, or most popular transmitted ones being Spanish, Arabic, and Italian. And then we, uh, which means that 39.2% were identified as non heritage language parents. Now, as you can see on the left, the most popular language combination uh, with which parents were raising their children was first English and French, followed by English, French, and other languages, which would correspond to the uh, most popular heritage language parents combination. Now, uh, in terms of the qualitative data uh, in the questionnaire, it was elicited through an one open-ended question about parents' desire for additional resources of all types. And uh, in terms of analysis, we conducted a corpus-assisted discourse study and we firstly examined uh, frequency. So those are frequently occurring terms. Then we looked at collocations, so those are words with which pertinent terms tended to co-occur. We also looked at concordance lines, and so those are uh, lines that present a lexical item uh, within its co-text across numerous texts. And finally, we also investigated larger text segments, which in this case would correspond to parents' quotes, larger quotes. Next slide. Now, for the sake of time today, I'll only present the overall frequency findings, which show the WPTT, so the words per 10,000, for each category of words that were found in the corpora. So, for example, each time a word associated to a desired resource was mentioned, its absolute frequency was uh, first calculated, then it was transformed into words uh, per 10,000 to allow for comparison. Now, first of all, the frequency findings support our distinction that we made at the outset between child-directed and parent-directed resources. In addition, an, another category that emerged from the inductive analysis of frequency relates to resources being either material, so books, uh, games, et cetera, or social resources. So those would be 
people, community, and groups. And that what also stood out from these findings is that there were commonalities uh, amongst both group of parents' desires. So for example, the non-heritage language parents in orange and the heritage language parents in blue, both had a stronger desire for additional child-directed resources than additional uh, parent-directed resources. And also both group of parents preferred or mentioned uh, desiring more material rather than social resources. Another important finding was also that books were the most frequently mentioned resources by both group of parents. Uh, in terms of differences, the heritage language parents showed a stronger desire for social resources than the non-heritage language parents, which is an interesting finding. And also more generally, the heritage language parents desired or had a stronger desire for um, all types of resources compared to non-heritage language parents, which confirms our prediction. Next slide, please. Now, in terms of collocations, uh, concordance lines, and larger text segments, what emerged was that, firstly, the non-heritage language parents felt that there were sufficient English and French monolingual resources. And uh, this is evident from words that collocated significantly with resources and ressources, uh, which were necessary, sufficient, necessaire, and aucune. Uh, this is also supported by the following quote, which reads, I don't feel a need for anything else, as French and English resources are easy to find here. Another important finding which emerged was that the heritage language parents desired more resources in heritage languages, just like we found in uh, the first phase of our research project. Again, this is evident from words that collocated significantly with more plus, which were Spanish, uh, but also other heritage languages such as Vietnamese and Arab. Uh, this point is also further exemplified by the concordance lines uh, that you can see here at the bottom for uh, the term Spanish which we chose as an example because it was the heritage language parents most um, frequently transmitted heritage language. And so as you can see here, the parents commented on their desire to have more access to Spanish resources so that their children could learn the language through books, games, lessons, and social activities. And next slide, please. Another finding that emerged was that both group of parents desired uh, multilingual uh, resources, so resources that combine several languages. For the non-heritage language parents, this was evidenced from uh, the collocates of more plus, which were uh, multilingual, bilingual, uh, as well as plurilingue and bilingue. Uh, the following concordance line for the, learn, uh, for the term bilingual also reflects uh, those collocation findings. So what you can see here is that the non-heritage language parents desired resources such as activities, toys, books, games, and shows that combine both languages that were being transmitted, so English and French. And for the uh, heritage language parents, uh, an example showing this desire can be found in the following quote. Most of the bilingual resources I come across is English plus another language, which is great, but would, I would like to see more French plus another language. I would like to see bilingual resources in French and Spanish. And so in conclusion, the findings from this study clearly demonstrate that parents want to use resources as a form of language management to promote their children's multilingual development. And also most importantly, uh, our findings made it evident that heritage language parents need particular support to uh, raise their infants and toddlers with multiple languages in the home. Thank you. I'll pass it on to Krista now. All right, so um, I'm going to be wrapping things up for the end of this presentation. Um, so thank you so much, Alexa, for that. So in our presentation today, we've discussed the specific context of Montreal and Quebec and our findings there. Um, so the particular attitudes, beliefs, practices, and needs for resources of these families who are raising multilingual infants. Uh, but of course, there are infants and toddlers all around the world who grow up bilingual and multilingual. And so we think that our results go beyond the particular context that we studied and offer a framework for thinking more broadly about bilingualism in infancy and toddlerhood. So I want to start really bringing us back to the multilingual infant herself. In this case, this is actually my own daughter uh, who uh, is growing up bilingual, uh, is no longer a baby. She's six years old uh, and she can, she can now speak English and French. Um, but thinking about children like her and other children who are acquiring other language pairs, we can disentangle some of the complexity of these early multilingual environments. So I'm gonna borrow here from Bromf and Brenner's ecological systems theory. 
And that theory says that development is affected by a complex systems, system of relationships that exists at many level, levels. So today we've been able to peel back some parts of this system. So on the largest scale, one theme from today uh, was about how much family language policy is actually affected by the societal and social context. So um, in our sample, particularly whether or not participants and, and families were speaking a heritage language. So it's not just about uh, whether children are being raised by or multilingual is the context of those languages in the greater society. These in turn affect family language policy and including as we've shown today, the resources that parents have and want, their language beliefs and attitudes, the concerns that they express, uh, as well as potentially their own proficiency in particular languages. At the next level closer to the child, these elements are going to affect language practices for the families. So this includes both the home language, so which uh, family members use which languages and how often they speak them, as well as decisions that families make about childcare. So what language or languages the childcare will be in. Um, and in fact, it affects what uh, childcare will be available to parents. So not all parents might have childcare available in their desired languages. These factors in turn affect really what's closest to the child, which is the speech that the child hears. So in particular, uh, whether they will hear sufficient quantity of each of the languages that the family wishes to transmit, um, and whether that speech will be of sufficient quality. So when I say quality here, I mean a high quality speech, so learning a language from speakers who actively engage with the infant versus hearing a language uh, only via YouTube videos, for example. So in terms of the policy implications that we can think about, uh, what we know is that infants need high quality and high quantity interactions in each of those languages that, that are being uh, transmitted. Um, but each bilingual family is unique in terms of their attitudes, their beliefs, their practices, and actually their needs for what can support these high quality, high quantity interactions. And we found uh, in a theme over and over that some children need more support, especially in our data, uh, children learning heritage languages in our sample, these were immigrant languages, um, but we expect based on other resources that uh, research that this would extend to indigenous languages as well. So communities need support provide, to provide support for families and caregivers wishing to raise multilingual children. This can be in the form of positive attitudes to the specific languages being transmitted, as well as multilingualism in general, social and material resources, both in the specific languages, but also in bilingual and multilingual formats, which parents have really been asking for, um, as well as time with their children. Um, so one, uh, one policy that can be really ben beneficial here is paid parental leave uh, where parents can spend time transmitting those languages, and especially if that parental leave can be shared by multiple caregivers who might speak different languages with the child. And finally, to bring up a theme that I spoke about earlier, and we have not yet explored directly in our data, but both typically and atypically children need to be supported. Um, so we know that there are bilingual children um, who are on the autism spectrum, who have specific language impairment, Down syndrome, dyslexia, uh, and many other concerns. And these children um, should be supported in the ways that they need and typically to the public children as well in the ways that they need. So that's the end of our presentation today. I wanna thank you so much for this presentation and to all of you from listening. And now we're going to open the floor up for some questions, which you can go ahead and put in the chat. We had, I had one question that I posted, but I think you addressed it, Krista, at the end. And we have one, and a few other questions here too. So one is, um, I'm wondering if the questionnaire based on existing studies in the field of family language policy, or did you develop your own questionnaire? We developed our own questionnaire. Um, it was based in a large part on the findings from study one, um, because as we mentioned in the different components of the study, um, this is really the first large scale study to investigate this issue um, in a predominantly multilingual society. There's been a lot of research in predominantly monolingual societies, 
Um, but as Erin discussed in a bit more detail, we assumed that there would be different kinds of attitudes, concerns, and so on going on in a predominantly multilingual society where we've got English and French as the societal languages. And in addition to that, we have heritage languages. So study one was the exploratory basis based upon which we then developed the questionnaire. Um, yeah, so each of the components for the questionnaire was developed newly based on study one and existing knowledge. Uh, we also have a question, it's elaborate uh, about uh, the desire for resources um, from Rebecca. And I'm just going to read the, the last part because I think uh, what, what she, Rebecca is saying is that the desire mentioned in the study was for Arabic, Spanish, and Italian, uh, which are global languages that have many resources available on the internet. And she was wondering if the, resource, the, the need for resource was more related to the need for community. Like, uh, I think going more in depth into the kind of resource, I guess. Yeah, sure. I think I can maybe try to answer this question. Uh, firstly, I think, uh, I think you're right. Uh, the internet does offer a lot of possibility in terms of finding resources in specific languages, such as those ones. However, because we're talking about infants and toddlers here, parents are not concerned as much with finding activities online, but more with actual books. And those seem to be uh, hard to find even in, um, in places like Quebec here. And so some of the parents that what we found in the literature was that some of the parents uh, often in those types of situations organized informal communities of parents sharing and exchanging books. Um, what was the other part of the question again? Sorry about resources, more specific types of resources. Yeah, um, definitely what emerged also as an important finding from this study was that the heritage language parents desired more social resources. So those would uh, include communities, groups, people, than the non-heritage language parents, which makes sense because the non-heritage language parents have access to a lot of, a lot of activities and, uh, and people generally speaking uh, English and French in the environment. I don't know if that answers the question. Uh, we have another question here about our attitudes towards uh, heritage languages promoted by the affective or cognitive components of attitudes. Do you think a language attitude study would reflect the risks of maintenance or loss for heritage language? Ooh, so we should say that we didn't investigate attitudes towards individual languages in this study. We looked at attitudes towards childhood multilingualism as a phenomenon. So based on our data, I can't really comment on attitudes towards those individual languages. Um, there's other research that has looked at that, but it has mainly focused on English and French comparatively or heritage languages individually without linking them with the other languages. So there isn't really any research yet that can answer this question. Um, but I think given the knowledge we have about the Quebec context and the utilitarian value that's attributed to heritage languages in Quebec, we can assume that attitudes towards heritage languages tend to be less positive on the status dimension than on the solidarity dimension. Um, and that the solidar attitudes on the solidarity dimension are presumably the driving factor in what causes parents to, to transmit them. Um, but comparing or investigating in more detail attitudes towards individual languages alongside attitudes towards childhood multilingualism is one of the directions for further research that we will probably be taking. Yeah, there is another question, and I think it's related to our study too, Ruth, about what basis did you choose? Did you cho choose the factors for the factor analysis? Um, I'm not entirely sure what's meant by choose here, um, whether, this, whether the person means the label that we gave them, because we didn't choose the factors. Um, the, in factor analysis, the factors emerge from the data. It's not us labeling them from the outside, but it's what emerges from the data. 
And those were three factors. Um, one, onto which all of the items loaded that were to do with the utilitarian value of multilingualism. One, onto which all of the items that were to do with in-group communication and community belonging loaded. And the third one, onto which all of the items related to cognitive development loaded. And so we gave them the same label, status and solidarity, that are used in discussions of attitudes towards individual languages and cognitive development we chose because all of the, the items that loaded onto that item were to do with cognitive benefits that are conferred by becoming multilingual in childhood, like becoming um, a more flexible thinker, a better learner, um, learning other languages easier in later life and so on. So the factors themselves emerged from the data, the labels we gave them based on um, the, the labels that are used for attitudes towards individual languages and the most pertinent term for the third factor. So we have two final questions here. So we have one with a number of 20 in the qualitative study, were any of the less frequently mentioned factors retained and made into questions on the survey? It occurs to me that a lot of interesting factors were likely eliminated before they had a chance to become important among a, a more representative sample. I think we may need to ask this person to clarify. Um, could you repeat the Gail first last? I think if I may just, I think I understand the question. The question being from the main find, the main findings or all of the findings that what we found in the first phase of the study, if all of these different elements were uh, in the questionnaire uh, in order to be measured and then also studied. And I don't know if I'm mistaken, Susan, maybe you can help me with that, but I think that most of the uh, important findings were included in the questionnaire. Yes, I think all of the, the most important findings are there. You know, occasionally, of course, with qualitative research, you're going to have a few parents who might have a differing point of view uh, or have something really interesting that you'd love to follow up on that may not have been there, but all of the important ones were there. We have um, another question here for parents' attitudes to our heritage language transmission. Just wondering, will that also be influenced by the numbers of the languages being transmitted? For example, French, English, heritage language, or English. So, so would, would trilingual uh, home environments make a difference related to bilingual home environments? I think you talked about this at one point. Is this question about transmission, about language practices? Is that, am I understanding that correctly? I think Erin was the one who had done some analysis looking at trilingual um, families specifically, and she has a specific interest in that. So maybe Erin, you could speak to that a little bit. Sure, I, I think I did also miss though the question whether the question was specifically targeting practices, concerns, or attitudes, but I can speak to um, the concerns part. So um, yes, uh, we did see that- What was about a... attitudes? Attitudes, okay. Um, well, I'll let Ruth chime in maybe at, after I explain my little bit. Um, so yes, we did find a difference between trilingual and bilingual families in terms of their level of concern, which likely would also be present. Um, and I think actually Ruth may be one of the predictors. Um, I can't remember if the number of languages transmitted was also a significant predictor for attitudes, but I think likely so. Um, but yes, uh, certainly um, we did see an effect of trilingualism. And I'll, I'll just say that actually, we're, as we're going through the qualitative analysis of the concerns, a lot of parents bring up the fact that there are three languages as being the cause for concern for them. Um, so yes, I do think that there is a difference between trilinguals and bilinguals in, in probably multiple ways in terms of their attitudes and concerns. Yeah, we didn't investigate trilingualism specifically for attitudes because we were trying to limit the number of uh, sociolinguistic variables that we were investigating as potential predictors. But this, the work that we're presenting today is certainly the starting point for further research. Um, at the moment regarding the attitudes, we're looking into further potential dimensions 
but we do also have the data to look at further potential predictors and trilingualism is certainly high up on the list of uh, things to, to investigate in the near future. And there is, we only have time for one more question. So uh, there's a question about if there was a change of attitude when the children joined preschool. Again, that's an important point for future research. Um, we did not study uh, attitudes towards childhood multilingualism longitudinally, and we didn't compare them um, between parents of very tiny children and parents with slightly older children. But we do know that external factors like socialization through daycare, socialization through schooling, but also other external factors like, for example, parents getting a divorce or um, the arrival of a new sibling. All of these things can cause changes in family language dynamics, which might be a reflection of um, changing language attitudes. And that's a really important issue to investigate because obviously while these children are in the home environment, um, the parents are the ones who have a large influence on what's happening around them linguistically what quality and quantity of input they receive in which languages. But once they're in daycare and in school, they, they're out in the wider world. There are other factors that play a much bigger role. Um, so yeah, the longitudinally, this would be a very interesting thing to study as well. Yes, for sure. Well, this was a wonderful, wonderful wealth of information. And uh, I'm looking forward to seeing the how the studies unfold too because it seems like there's a lot too that you are still uh, exploring which is exciting so thank you so much for this so informative and everyone we are continuing this conversation if you are part of twitter or if you want to join us at tsol bimuti and all of the presenters are also on twitter they can engage with you uh, more but also send us any questions that you might have and uh, do you have a contact information where people can contact you if they have questions or if they want to uh, explore any of these topics um, so that people can contact you in the future? Thanks so much again for the invitation to give this talk, Clara. Of course, we are honored and it's an important topic for everyone that is trying to keep their languages for sure. <laughs> it's not an easy feat. So thank you everyone and have a wonderful, wonderful day.